I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Mrs. Mayor, if you would please call the roll. I'd be happy to. Tim Minker. Here. Colin Trivet. Here. Lisa Collins. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Joe Gittens. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita Shekosinski. She will be late. Okay. Pete Mayor, I am here. Okay, thank you. With six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Uh, approval of the agenda. I would note that the agenda has been posted, distributed, and sent to the local media. With that in mind, are there any changes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda as posted. I would so move. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda as published. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time limit per person be followed and that you come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. I don't see anyone coming forward, but I would note that Francis Brown wants to make his um, donation, the annual check donation that he's done, and we did indicate to him, he said he wouldn't be here right at seven, that we would make time for him later in the agenda when he comes, if that's okay with the rest of the board, so, okay. Then moving on to reports and discussion. Nutritional services, year-end food service financial report. Mr. Gasper. Good evening. I am here tonight to present the 2012-2013 uh, Student Nu Universal Nutrition Program uh, Annual Report. My report today will be broken into three different sections. Food service results measures, uh, how we support other departments' results measures, and what's in store for this upcoming, soon to be upcoming school year. There are several results measures identified for food service so that data can be tracked and analyzed to gauge our performance. Uh, when possible, these measures contain uh, comparable data from both other schools in the Mississippi Valley Conference and state averages. Uh, measures that we've identified are percent participation at both breakfast and lunch, uh, meal pricing compared to other districts in our area, our food cost, fund balance as a percent of total expenditures, um, and this is a measure of overall program financial success. Uh, unless we remain self-funded, uh, dollars would have to be taken from the general fund, uh, which takes away from student learning. Um, and then finally, nutritional value of our meals. Percent participation. Our breakfast participation has experienced continued growth since the 2006-2007 school year. Um, in 11-12, we reached our highest rate of 32.5%. And uh, although the 12-13 school year results are not quite final, we do anticipate that that'll be relatively the same for breakfast. Our lunch participation, um, again, we, uh, we had 102.5% in 11-12. Uh, however, in 12-13, we do anticipate there's probably going to be about a 3% drop. Uh, much of this, uh, if you recall, the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act was implemented at the start of last school year, uh, and there was uh, a significant drop in participation, although as the year went on, uh, our participation continued to grow each month. Um, you can see, though, we do compare very favorably to our Mississippi Valley Conference comparables. Breakfast pricing, I was here about a month ago talking about pricing for this new school year. You can see that we have not raised our breakfast prices in quite some time, and we are approximately 12 cents lower than the average uh, Mississippi Valley Conference school for breakfast. Our lunch pricing is approximately 17 cents below the average for the Mississippi Valley Conference. Uh, however, due to the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act, we do have to continually raise that until uh, we get to the point where we're charging the difference between uh, a 
free meal reimbursement and a paid, paid meal reimbursement, which this year was $2.51. Food cost per meal is one of the management tools we use to achieve a positive fund balance. Uh, in 12-13, it actually decreased from the uh, previous year uh, from $1.69.4 to $1.69.2. So it was a very small decrease, but nonetheless a decrease. There's probably not very many uh, consumables that you can say actually went down uh, in price. So we're very proud of that. Uh, that was accomplished through good purchasing practices. We've uh, joined with a few other districts uh, to form a purchasing co-op. Um, and uh, the staff worked very hard to utilize our food supplies in the most efficient way that we could so we had very little waste uh, which contributed greatly to that this is probably the big one um, the final audited numbers are not yet available for for last year however estimates show that we will slightly exceed our stated fund balance target of 150 percent of the greatest month's expenses um, it's estimated that we had a surplus of approximately $26,000 in uh, this past year. Uh, and because we are over what our target is, um, we've accelerated the purchasing of new equipment. Some equipment that was slated to be purchased this year, this fiscal year, we actually purchased before uh, the 12-13 year was uh, expired. Uh, we, over the year, we bought three new ovens, a dishwasher, five new warming boxes, and a steam kettle for the middle school. And again, this is important because if we can maintain a fund balance, we don't have to take away dollars from the general fund um, and, and away from students. Nutritional values, another thing we have to track with the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act, this chart shows um, Saturated fat as a percent of total calories. Uh, the USDA states that we have to have less than 10 percent. As <coughs> you can see, in the elementary school, we had 8 percent, and the high school and middle school both had 7 percent. So we met that target in all three cases. Uh, average calories per meal. The target at the elementary school is 550 to 650, and we were at 600 in two, basically. Uh, the middle school is 600 to 700, and we were at 697.66. And the high school is 750 to 850, and we were at 815.94. Um, by meeting these requirements set forth by the USDA, um, we received an extra six cents per meal in reimbursement, um, which is key to maintaining our financial uh, uh, status. We also completed an audit by DPI in uh, May that certified us as compliant with the new menu requirements. This chart just shows you uh, for the last 14 years, the school nutrition program here in Holman has not had to take any of those funds from the general fund um, to maintain our financial status. All right, how we support other department goals. Nutrition services also help support others um, in two areas, basically, in student achievement and community involvement. Student achievement. Well-nourished students are healthier, behave better, and learn better. Uh, this spring, uh, school gardens were planted at all four elementary schools. Um, as well as the high school. Um, if you go behind the high school where the air handler is, you'll see a bunch of boxes with a bunch of plants growing out of them. Those are potatoes that we'll be using in our lunch line at the high school. Uh, in addition to that, we partnered with the FFA. Uh, they had a student who was doing a project, wanted to do hyper hydroponics, excuse me. Uh, so as you can see, the bottom left and bottom center picture are the lettuce that we are growing year-round now at the high school uh, and then the bottom right-hand picture is the lettuce actually processed and used on our salad bar so uh, it's not quite enough yet to do all of our uh, needs as far as lettuce at the high school but um, I would say probably three to four days a week we have that uh, very healthy homegrown lettuce no chemicals involved um, <clears throat> It's not certified organic, but it's about as close as you could possibly get. I'm really not aware of any other school district in the state 
doing this kind of a project. Uh, and again, Roger King and, and the folks over at the FFA did a wonderful job with this. We're actually purchasing this year uh, another set of those troughs that you see there where the lettuce grows to hopefully get more. Um, in addition to that, all the elementary schools again have, uh, they're growing lettuce, beans, broccoli, tomatoes, peppers, you name it. And all those products will be used in our, our lunch lines, either on our salad bar or in recipes. Another area for student achievement was our farm to school cooking classes. Uh, we again partnered with uh, Gunnarsson Healthcare and uh, Chef Thomas uh, with his cooking classes. Uh, what happens there is uh, he develops a couple of recipes that uh, center around the harvest of the month. And um, we get a couple of student chefs to come up and help prepare those recipes, and then all the kids in the, in the school basically get samples of that recipe. And the hope is when they actually see that recipe then on the menu, uh, they're more willing to try that recipe and hopefully get some good vegetables into them. Another uh, area we partnered with Chef Thomas, he wrote a grant um, and he received it and we came up with the Chef Thomas Bean Challenge. And what that was is each student in all of our all of our elementary schools received a package of uh, bean seeds and they were encouraged to go home, plant the seeds, grow their uh, plant throughout the summer and document their progress and then bring back uh, pictures of it, maybe a recipe. So you can see there uh, three of the students that actually did that. It was uh, so successful that we did it again this spring, only we actually expanded it out to seven other um, schools in our county. Uh, and over 4,500 seed packets were distributed, and we'll see how many we actually get back uh, in the fall here. Uh, another great program that we started was our first annual uh, Iron Chef Holman competition this year. I believe it was in March. Um, what it was is students were uh, encouraged to create a recipe that had to include two harvests of our harvest of the month products that we had. Um, they could pick whatever, come up with recipes. We picked six finalists, and then they were invited into the face uh, laboratory, and um, they prepared the meal from start to finish. They had to display it on school lunch trays, and then they had to go before a, a panel of celebrity judges to present to them and then they judged on taste, appearance, presentation, everything and the winner was Emily Armstrong and uh, her winning recipe was kakaliki soup uh, and for that she won $500, our second place won 200 our third place won 100 and the first place winner actually had her recipe on the menu at the high school twice uh, in the last couple months so that was pretty exciting and we plan on doing that again this coming year. Uh, another area, our famous, now famous elementary school picnics, all school picnics. This year it was over 1,620 students partook in the picnics. Over 1,271 adults also came into our schools to see the environment that we collectively as a school district um, have in our schools. I think it's a really neat event to see families there on the playground at recess, walking through the schools and just being part of the school environment. Uh, we also had the home and fire department come in and serve, which is always great for the kids. Uh, we have special events, uh, a new one this year that we were able to do. We had points accumulated for buying certain products that we were going to lose our points if I didn't spend them. So I thought, you know what, we're going to spend them on some bikes. So we got bikes. Uh, we gave a bike away at, at all of our elementary schools and one at the middle school. Um, and basically, all the kids in the school were eligible, and we picked them at random. And then uh, at an assembly, nobody knew who the winner was until the assembly, and then we called the kid up, and they got to uh, receive their bike. So it was pretty exciting uh, uh, for everybody. All right. What's in store for this coming year? We have a new POS system. That's a point of sale system. Previously, we had a system that did not talk to the student information system. So there was much duplication of work. Um, we have purchased the Infinite Campus POS system. So now when a student um, is enrolled in our district, everything happens automatically. They get their new lunch account number, their PIN number. It's all set up to be automated. Uh, we have a new online payment system that goes along with this. Uh, previously, it took up to 24 hours for an online payment to actually show up in a student's account. Now it's, uh, we tried it today, actually, and it took approximately five seconds. 
to show up in the student accounts. So um, that's going to prevent a lot of uh, extra communication that we had to have between the schools. Um, when, it, when it's put in, it, it happens immediately. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, continuation of the uh, Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act. Um, this year, breakfasts uh, were kind of the target of the act. Uh, you're going to see all whole grains. Everything is a whole grain, whole grain rich, I should say. So it has to be 51% or more whole grain. Um, they're also going to be restricting sodium, fat, and calorie levels at breakfast. Uh, next year, you can look forward to changes in the a la carte regulations as well. But this year, uh, we will still have cookies at the high school. So I know <laughs> students will be very happy to hear that. <laughs> Cooking classes, uh, Chef Thomas, in fact, emailed me today. And we're, we're in the process of setting those up. So we'll have those again this year. Uh, Farm to School, uh, as always, will be here. Um, this year, we're featuring bell peppers, kale, leeks, Brussels sprouts again, squash, rutabagas, colored potatoes, um, radishes, and asparagus, along with several of the harvests in the months that we've had in previous years. So uh, that should be a lot of fun. And there'll be taste testing in the schools like we've been doing for the last uh, three years. School gardens, again, um, we keep expanding that. I know the middle school is looking to get into that this coming year, um, as well as the uh, uh, FFA in the high school, I know, has been working on getting an off-site off -site garden as well going. So we'll see how that all pans out. Um, Salad bars daily in all of our schools. It's really important. We really want to stress that that you know while there is that vegetable requirement, vegetable or fruit requirement that students have to take, Every school has a fresh salad bar with, with locally grown produce on it, um, and we highly encourage kids to take advantage of that. Uh, again, more local fruits and veggies, and more from scratch recipes. A lot of those come from Chef Thomas. Any questions? That was a lot to say. A lot of good information. So, Any questions? Oh, I don't know where to be again with kudos I, I think I just want to say something so that any parents watching need to appreciate what we have in Holman um, I expertise from fun balance so that you're able to purchase things nutrition uh, everything you just said is like beyond state-of-the-art and uh, I want moms and dads to know that I know that there have been changes in the requirements our lunches and sometimes parents and children don't always appreciate that but um, I just thank you so much for what you do for our kids and uh, I know your report is like zoom zoom because that's what you do but even to figure out the nutrients in a lunch and the calories and the oil content I can't begin to imagine how long that takes so thank you for everything you're doing both monetarily for the district and uh, for our children well, and I, I do want to point out again, too, that it's, it's the entire staff that we have here at home and is absolutely fantastic, and they do a wonderful job. Yes. Day in and day out. They're, they're truly the ones that, that make it go. Well, send them our kudos as well, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, no other Thank questions you. or comments? Thank you, Mr. Gasper, very much. Okay, then moving on to buildings and grounds, entrance security, Mr. Daly. Thank you. Um, as you know, the board changed its policy last year and said that we will have all doors locked at our buildings and monitored uh, during school hours after the kids get there. So to do this, uh, um, the approval I'm seeking tonight is to ask for an exemption to the board bid policy 472, which, and then uh, just due to time time restraints that would be required to go through this whole bidding process and writing specs and all that, um, and to try to have these buildings secure by the time school starts or shortly thereafter. Um, 
one of the things you, I'm asking for that I'm asking you to approve tonight is is uh, the school security. Um, this is the action item tonight. Um, what we did, and I, and I apologize, I just handed out these quotes now. I was supposed to have it with that uh, with the uh, with the issue paper, but I, I didn't. Um, you have it now before you. But here's what you're looking at. We did go out and, and get, uh, even though we didn't bid this, uh, we did go out and get a, a bunch of quotes. And everybody quotes um, their own products and such, um, although some of it is very similar. For instance, the, uh, the, the camera and intercom systems were all the same from each of these bidders. Um, the biggest cost of this project, though, which, which is about, um, which will be about $31,000, is the door hardware. What, we're, what we decided to do um, is uh, to go ahead and, and put locks on the inside vestibule doors in our main entrances. Right now, none of them are lockable. So that's where the majority of this cost will come from, is door hardware for that. The idea there is um, there may be times when the, the school secretary or whoever is monitoring those doors from a remote location with the camera and intercom may not be at their desk, so we want people to be able to get out of the weather inside, and if they've got to wait, at least they're waiting inside the vestibule itself. And from there, they will push a button, there'll be a camera there, um, and somebody, <coughs> whoever's in charge of, of answering that will ask their business and who they are and ask their business and then allow them through. Um, and again, to get this done, by the time school starts or shortly thereafter. I'm asking for that approval tonight. Is there any more question, any questions or more details you would like about that? Okay. Thank you very much. John, so is the bid then, because I think the position paper says 31 Right. Um, if you look on there, you'll see there's a, there were a number of bids. Uh, some of some of the some of the uh, the vendors combined the door hardware and the uh, um, the camera and intercom system because because they could do it all. Mm -hmm. um, I had a, a couple of bidders: one that just did the intercom part, and one that just did the door hardware part. And what I what I'm recommending is is glass service. Who did the the door hardware part in Permar? Uh, those are two vendors we work with quite often. They were the low bid, but in addition to um, um, the glass service bid, also included some things that the other bidders didn't include. Um, the main thing is the door at Evergreen. We don't have an inside power door opener closer for uh, acc for accessibility, which we'll have to have on there. It was included in their bid, and 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 uh, you know, um, if I would, if if you wanted to compare apples to apples, we would really had to take off uh, probably twenty five hundred dollars from their bid. So their bid, even though those two together are thirty one, you know, some might say, you know, there's an advantage of going to the thirty two nine bid because it's one company and we only have to deal with one company. But in, in reality, what we're getting for that 31 is much more than what we're getting for the almost $33,000. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Then building services 2013-14 proposed budget. We don't have any new information to present, but I wanted to put this on the agenda after talking with Mrs. Hancock as an opportunity for the board to ask any remaining questions. This is part of the consent agenda this evening, but at this point, um, we have nothing further to add to what was presented to you back in July. As, as we all know, this will continue to be a work in progress leading all the way up through October when the board approves that final or we will call it the original budget um, along with certifying the levy so we wanted to put it here in case you did have questions that either mr. Clark or I could respond to um, as again as it does appear on your consent agenda this evening is there anything All 
Great, wonderful. Then we had some collective bargaining agreement. Um, if you want to start with HCME. Well, yes, and I, I would be happy to, uh, maybe we can talk about all four. You have four of them this evening. Uh, Mr. Clark and I can go through those for you. Stop at any of them along the way that you have questions. We'll make sure when we're done with the fourth one uh, to also ask for questions, if that's all right. And uh, because you're going to see a lot of similarity in the format of the issue paper. So uh, Mr. Clark's going to go through the first one. And once you go through that with him, um, if it hasn't already made more sense, uh, it should make more sense as you go through the remaining three. So Jay, we'll start with the custodial maintenance. That's item 7.4 on your reports and discussion agenda. So this is the Home and Custodial Maintenance Employees Association. And uh, the collective bargaining agreement for that group, which consists of the base wage uh, schedule, expired on June 30th, 2013. And uh, in mid-July, uh, representatives of the board, administration, and then the association met on the 2013-14 school year base wage uh, increase and schedule. The proposed wage agreement that you have been presented with uh, shows an increase in wages of 1.897%. This is an increase in the base wages. The team arrived at this percentage increase um, by first considering the cost equivalent of a 2.07%. And the board may be familiar with that because that's the consumer price index uh, increase that's allowed under the current law. Um, they started with the 2.07 and then looked at what was the impact of granting longevity increases. The current structure of payment offers built in three, four, five, and six percent increases after achieving certain years of service in the district, all the way out to 17 years of service in the district. Accounting for the cost of those individuals who had achieved those longevity increases, the 2.07 was reduced to 1.897. Those were the dollars remaining after ensuring those longevity increases would be granted. For this group then, that dollar amount divided out amongst all the hours in the group resulted in a 32 cent per hour increase for 2013-14. So all employees within these classifications, and they're all listed on the issue paper, would receive that 32 cent per hour increase. Some also receiving the longevity increase that I spoke about a moment ago. There are 44 employees in this group, and you have cost information outlined for you in terms of the salaries and the benefits that are determined by salary amount. The funding source for these wage increases will be the general fund salary and benefits budget, which you're being asked to approve as a part of the overall budget later tonight. Please remember that this is a mandate. Your issue paper asks us to identify if these are required activities. Uh, this base wage negotiations is mandated under state law. And so the recommendation advanced by administration and the board members who were on that committee is to approve uh, the base wage settlement. This has been voted on by the HCME members and approved, just awaiting board approval. That is the HCME settlement. So before I go on to the next one, just a reminder, yes, uh, thank you to uh, all involved. Again, board member representation, administration, and the association representatives. And so if there are questions, uh, board members who were part of a particular group, uh, please uh, feel free to respond, or if you have comments that you feel um, are appropriate as well. So uh, if we go on to the next one, the HESP, um, so our, our educational uh, support professionals. And so as Mr. Clark went through, the format is, is similar. And so perhaps just kind of highlight um, as we work through this, the base wage agreement then um, out of that 2.07 after looking at considering longevity for this group 
is 1.56%. So you'll note in all four of these, it's a different amount. And it comes down to longevity for those groups, as Mr. Clark mentioned. Um, that is resulting in this group as a 22 cent per hour increase. You'll note this is, um, I believe, our largest hourly um, association with 110 uh, uh, impacted employees. And so, again, we try to make sure that the issue paper is in the same format, um, and those were highlighting kind of the major pieces to it. If we go on with hope, so our office professionals, <clears throat> you will see here that the base wage increase amounts to a 2.004%. I believe you'll find that maybe be the highest, and, it, and it's simply because the longevity has the least impact on this group. So this results in about a 34% or 34 cent uh, increase uh, per hour for this group. And we have uh, 35 employees that are impacted in this group. We'll just run through the fourth one. Now, jumping back to me, we... I was the lead administrative rep on the Drivers Association group and uh, similar uh, information. Uh, after accounting for longevity, a 1.475% base wage increase for the group. And that meant 28 cents per hour <coughs> for members of the Drivers Association. Uh, there are 39 members in this group. Uh, and again, as with the other three, the funding sources, the general fund salaries and benefits uh, budget. So I think questions, comments? Any questions? And as they indicated, they are on the consent agenda item this evening. So. Um, yeah, we, uh, as part of the driver association, you should have, as part of the reports, you should have an additional issue paper. And I want to just, this is the time to just address that, even though this particular piece um, we don't have it down as an action item this evening. So we would be needing to bring that back to the board at the next, uh, the 26th meeting. But if you could just uh, take a look at that, I am going to ask Mr. Clark um, if he would want to make a few comments about this uh, issue paper. And this would be under item 7.7, .7. it's uh, uh, document C within that group, uh, topic being van driver wage rate adjustment. As a part of the transition from um, a collective bargaining agreement, which dealt with a broad set of issues, including benefits, <coughs> uh, to uh, a collective bargaining agreement, which was really exclusively dealing with base wages, uh, the employee handbook reclassified band drivers to limited term employee positions. And uh, one of the effects of this was it eliminated paid leave benefits for the group. And that was not the intent of the reclassification. There were many other factors driving the reclassification. It was just kind of a side effect, uh, a side effect that we didn't want to create a hardship for uh, employees. And to compensate for the lost paid leave benefits, administration is recommending a wage rate e increase, which is equivalent to the monetary value of the lost paid leave time. And so for this group of employees, which is the only hourly group of employees that this happened with, um, the equivalent hourly pay rate to the loss of paid leave time and unused sick leave time paid at time of um, end of employment with the district is 43 cents per hour. So um, not an action item tonight but for your future consideration this is not is not a part of the negotiations the board 
uh, is addressing negotiations through the separate action item. Um, this is um, related to and of course being close to the start of the school year we want to keep these things coming to closure um, but it would be something you'd be asked to act upon later but we're prepared to answer any questions for you tonight uh, before the next meeting where you'd be asked to take action again when we presented this language item previously we had made mention <coughs> that there would be uh, that that this would be occurring uh, we did not have calculated at that time specifically the amount but had presented that to the board and but we do want to um, part of not taking action tonight is to bring it to your attention and report but also to separate it as mr. Clark is saying from the agreement because it's not part of that but it, it it's pertinent to the to the overall issue so we will plan to bring that item back to you as part of the consent agenda on the 26th that's it unless you have questions any questions about those okay then we would move on to human resources employee handbook uh, flexible schedule <coughs> Melissa good evening let me find it Do I hear the band out there What's she kidding <laughs> Um, so the item I am bringing forward tonight is regarding the flexible spending language in the employee handbook or not flexible spending I'm sorry um, <laughs> flexible scheduling which is found in um, the part three section of for hourly employees and this language is specific to the school year educational assistants and secretaries regarding early release times um, last year in September we um, realized that we neglected to fully address the early release times that we have in regards to some of our hourly employees, mainly this school year secretaries and EAs. So we came to you and you approved some clarifying language that helped us get through the school year. And um, we've come to realize that we put a sunset on that language and didn't have enough data to fully analyze the impact of that language and if it worked, if it didn't work. So what I'm requesting tonight is to expand that sunset date from June 30th, 2013 to June 30th, 2014. Um, and I'm actually bringing this forward tonight as a presentation and requesting consent as well. I know this falls outside of our normal process. However, in order to get it approved and into the handbook in a timely manner, um, we would require a consent tonight so that would allow us to fully gather the data that we need at the start of the school year based on the language that we have and um, analyze that as we go throughout the year and how people are using the flex language that we have and then determine what is the best language so we can come forward at the end of next school year and determine what that language actually should be um, so right. any we, we had missed this a year ago yeah. and we had to come back and cause some issues for our employ for our <coughs> educational assistance mm -hmm. and um, and our principals and so uh, we got it straightened out it was received um, I think very favorably yeah this language was what they had previously right. essentially. and so um, we still want to take further look at this that's why we're still we're still incorporating keeping the sunset piece in there so I'm confident and you should be confident that uh, this can appear on the consent agenda and move forward because it will mm -hmm. impact even the 28th and yeah 29th I yep. believe that so we want to get 26th. this we want to reassure our people that this is still in effect so any questions all right I, I guess my only question yeah. would be the need for the sunset because we could in a year you could do all of the things you need to do mm -hmm. and in a year say yeah we want to change that mm -hmm and you wouldn't have to have that sunset in there to do that is there yeah I think the sunset just forces us to okay. look at that data and make that decision what the language really should be versus just leaving it static if there's something different that works better that's something we definitely want to look at for our employees but you can do that anyway right. so that's just and then you're not forced to come back next year and say oops yeah. <laughs> it sunsets again yeah and I think what change. we want to do is since we approved it so late in the year last year we really don't have that data to help us okay. 
figure out what worked last year. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Melissa. Then the next item is School Calendar <laughs> Consortium, Dr. Carlson. Thank you. As Wendy makes her way up, I'm going to um, have her bring this up. Um, as soon as she gets that going. Okay, there we go. I want to provide the board with an update on discussion that is taking place among regional school districts regarding the school year calendar. As shared with the board previously, uh, we've been part of a discussion with other area superintendents and their key people that are involved with uh, setting school calendars about alternative school year calendars. Recently, representatives from seven school districts met, actually we hosted that here, to share thoughts on the development of school calendars. As a result, there was interest in forming, we're referring to it as a consortium of school districts who share common interests in looking at alternative calendars. Um, specifically, there is interest in developing and implementing a school calendar that positively impacts student learning by exploring and examining benefits for moving forward with a common start and a common ending time. So a common start and common, common ending dates. With the expanded calendar as a goal in between. So it's much of what you have been talking about as, uh, again, taking the school year, expanding it, which naturally would, would have to impact both or at least one of the starting date or ending date. In your packet, you'll find samples of calendars developed by some of the other districts that are part of our conversation. You will also find uh, among those, I, I believe um, you'll find two that uh, do not have a name on it. Um, not sure at this point of how much publicly those have been shared so I uh, communicate with the superintendents that we would uh, put those up there and and without their name but you also find the calendar in there for La Crosse Hamilton Elementary which as many know they are in the middle of starting their first um, run at the year the year-round school calendar for that <clears throat> A little bit about what's been leading up to this. Uh, again, the board had expressed interest in exploring an expanded school year, which aligns with the purpose of the consortium. <clears throat> Last year, an administrative group explored limited research on some research on year round school calendars, finding support for such a calendar specific to, and I've invited Wendy to add <coughs> comments to this presentation as well if, if needed. But we are finding some of our youngest students, primary grades, but also some of our special populations, whether special education, our lower socioeconomic uh, group of students. So that is what we are finding that had the uh, greatest impact on expanding that school year. <clears throat> I just, uh, it's important to note, and we'll be able to report later, at a, a near future board meeting. Um, for example, our K-5 summer school program this year increased significantly. I, I put that there just as perhaps a, a note to make that of the parent interest of growing our opportunities in the summer, uh, or at least between, um, between the school year. I think the same is true at, at our middle school um, as far as some of our enrollment in our, our summer school program there too that you will see uh, an increase there for this that was just completed last week. At this time school districts are unable to begin school prior to September 1. Uh, there is an exception for those that look at a 45-15 year round calendar such as the Lacrosse Hamilton uh, model. And that's where students are in session for nine weeks, out of session for three weeks, back in, in a cycle of four. 
uh, with that. And uh, we would want to make sure that, uh, I guess at this point, we're still wondering if that would be the best model for us. And that's part of the, dis the discussion uh, with the consortium. A little bit more about the start date proposal. You may have seen that. I know I've communicated some of that. Uh, but there is a proposal uh, that's hopefully going to be addressed uh, when they get back, I believe in September, probably at the earliest. Um, so we won't know. But this is uh, something that's been in place for a while. And uh, it has uh, caused a lot of discussion. I've been a, a constant advocate for making sure that that the start date be a local decision uh, for a local Board of Education to make. I'm hopeful, mainly because of how this legislation has come to be, it's a little different than in the past. So um, I, it, if you, I would encourage board members to have a discussion and, and certainly share your thoughts on that. But I, I know that I believe it would be the right thing to do to make sure that we have local decision on the start date. <clears throat> so next steps, uh, looking at, uh, I'm, I'm here just to look, listen to you, your feedback, your comments. We do have another consortium meeting scheduled for this Friday, the 16th, and we're going to host that here again. And we were all to go and have a conversation or inform our boards of the work that we are doing or starting to do. <coughs> and report back the level of interest that our boards have in this as far as being part of a common discussion uh, regionally with our with the other schools some of the other schools uh, you have um, the lacrosse school district on alaska uh, sparta toma west salem <laughs> get invited uh, bangor was unable to be with us uh, we've had conversation of at some point, we'd want to uh, include our private school partners as well. And so that gives you an idea of who's in the consortium at this time. We've talked about expanding it. But again, feeling what do we have in common um, uh, with that. So we know we have a lot of work to do. We have a rationale to further explore questions, uh, the barriers. I think people are quick to rush to the barriers and the challenges and uh, we want to make sure that we go about this right so this is just a check-in with the board but it's more specifically to share with you what is going on beyond just us and more regionally um, so with that I'd be happy to take questions but interested if I can get kind of a an indication I'm not a, this is not for an action item tonight but again certainly understand in the past, the board's interest that you have conveyed in exploring more options beyond what we have now at that traditional school year. We started to do that. It kind of grew into a larger conversation with many of our neighbors. And uh, I have invited those people to come together, and, and so far we've had some good conversation. Uh, before, uh, Wendy, I don't know anything further to add? No, you've done a great job. Okay questions or comments well I know when you and I talked about you bringing this here you had shared an example I think of a district that had done a lot of work and then so I think that was one of the reasons why we wanted to sure. have you bring it if you want to just maybe share that with yeah, one of the one of the issues that we're talking in this group is um, how do you go about um, what's the right sequence of things one of the districts in this group has had has done a lot of work, put a calendar together. In fact, I believe it's one of the calendars that you have, and had community conversation, got a lot of buy-in, stakeholders, then went to DPI and was turned down. So one of, the, one of our conversations is um, trying to get an idea of what might be acceptable is there any way to have something acceptable beyond that 4515 calendar before you have a large stakeholder uh, initiative conversation at the community level and so you that's what we're kind of balancing the lacrosse with hamilton again that was a 
uh, that was a quite a process but really locally to that school and that's that real specific school community and that was really teacher-led at Hamilton it was the teachers started that movement so right that's important to note too so they had the buy-in of the educators already in that school is Hamilton a charter school I don't I don't believe I don't so. not for not what they're running on this schedule is there one in I believe there is another school housed within that building but I don't I don't know for sure that may not be accurate but I'm just wondering why they picked <coughs> Hamilton as a Joe I think the reason they picked Hamilton the research that we looked at said the biggest impact was on students with low socioeconomic status so students high in poverty and Hamilton does have a higher poverty rate than many of the other schools in La Crosse and then I think as you said there was an interest by a new teacher um, who had worked in that um, schedule and so had experienced the positive impact of that and so started to have that conversation and and it just kind of grew from there so I also know that some of the earlier conversation the board has had over time is uh, some of those challenges or barriers sometimes um, there might be conversation about cost for example and um, I think that's one of those things that uh, that's it's not assumed in any way that there automatically is an increase a cost it's increase 45 15 that's been long, long, an awful long time so it, it depends on a number of other factors and variables that would impact greater the cost factor than just the calendar itself being dr driving that so, I just remember something uh, years ago when we were looking at changing our start time the day start time and the fact that the impact of us starting our high school at a later time of the day we were actually looking at starting high school because research showed that that's the way we should be doing it elementary should be first <coughs> high school should be second just because of sleep patterns but the impact of us then participating with other schools in the area and the, if they didn't move to that same schedule the negative impact that would have had so the consortium idea I think is a great one because if we do it when we'll the, get everyone so on the same if page everybody first. else is on the state same page that makes that a little bit more palatable um, and there are certainly I think you've heard Tim and others say they have a real interest in that and we've really talked about wanting to make sure we do it with that community input but then as Dr. Carlson said do we go through all of that and have all his buy-in and then be told <coughs> no and then DPI says no yeah although you know it you'd hate to just formulate a policy like that based on the potential they might say no and is the 4515 I think there was some concern that you've had or that you've seen in that 4515 so you don't necessarily feel that's the best although correct uh, we're just not sure and um, but another purpose for this consortium is the idea is more schools perhaps we could have a greater impact if needed even um, on that legislation or and uh, to come forward with possibly in some type of change if something were not to change for September 1 that doesn't in my opinion that doesn't end this conversation um, you can continue the school year um, on uh, there really doesn't seem to be an ending date um, <laughs> but I'm not I'm not I want to make sure anybody watching I'm not advocating for a, a longer going later in June as well so but that but that can be part of that discussion so I would say to everybody that um, if the start date does not change that doesn't <coughs> mean that this conversation will end um, I just wondered um, Dale or Wendy um, what do you hear about in the rest of the state are there other school districts coming together that are locally have much in common is this the only one you've heard of and maybe you don't know the answer to that yet but for me it's 
the only one that I've heard of. We're the only ones at this point. Um, I would guess eventually that there must be some that are going to explore this because it's such a, an important topic. But right now, you don't know of any others, right? I, I'm not aware. Um, yeah, we have made our um, CESA 4 aware, and I think there's interest there of perhaps growing and expanding the conversation among uh, uh, beyond the schools that I had mentioned. Right. Unless I maybe hear any concerns, I will move forward. Okay. Yeah, I think if you took a, a group of six, you take a group of six schools that go to DPI and ask for that, there certainly would be a little bit more. Mm -hmm. numbers. And some of those barriers by having this group come together really kind of fall by the wayside if they're all. That's part of the, uh, the thought there, correct? Part of the rationale. But I, you know, do think at some point we need to make sure that we have that community and staff, all the stakeholder buy-in so that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we will continue to report back on progress. Wonderful. Thank you. And then the next item is staffing report, update and recommendation. You have, um, just give me a minute to transition here. You have in your packet two issue papers that are they're really part of that personnel section. And I'll go through the first one. The first one, would I think we have it labeled 7. Uh, well, they're both under 710. The first one I'll take is the additional 1.0 FTE teaching position for the four-year-old kindergarten program. Back in May, when I presented the staffing plan that the board approved, on that plan, I had indicated that the staffing uh, for our 4K, our public school, uh, public preschool program, our early childhood and 4, 4K, um, specifically our 4K program, we were down 0.5 of a section due to enrollment. So that's what you approved on your staffing plan. Since May, uh, Mrs. Ms. Zeitlin has been monitoring it daily of late, and we have grown in enrollment. I think, did I see 226 today? 225, 226 uh, in, that, in that area. Um, that is, has grown significantly since that staffing plan. In fact, it has really surpassed the, the recommended uh, point where we, where, we, where we would just increase a half a position all the way to a full position. So um, I don't want to read through the issue paper for you, but if you have questions, you'll, you can see that as of when I put this packet together, we are at 221. And Sue mentioned that we've already grown another four or five students since last week. So it would be the recommendation to go ahead, move forward, add this position, um, I believe, this would result in a uh, transfer um, of an individual, and then we would have a posting uh, in another position that we would do. So uh, the other position bringing forward to you tonight also has to do with some of the dynamics uh, with, the, with the middle school and the increased enrollment that we have been experiencing recently. Um, that we are recommending to increase the 0.5 position that you had earlier approved as part of the staffing plan and budget uh, of the math intervention specialist at the middle school. Coming to you and asking to increase that from 0.5 to, to 0.8 FTE. That would help Mr. Vogler and the staff address some of the ongoing or the growing math scheduling issues at this school. And um, so he has worked very hard with his staff. He came forward with this request and I'm supporting this. We do believe we have a unique, we, on this edition, working with um, Mrs. Savasky, I believe we have funding through title that will help us out in making up the difference for this position. So those are the two that I wanna bring to your attention that, um, would be in addition to the personnel report 
and part of your consent agenda this evening. Any questions? questions? Just um, confirming, I note that looking at the, the map position, I see a note that says um, not increasing this math staffing would likely result in canceling one section of advanced math and or increase class sizes in math to exceed 30. And either one of those are a bit alarming to me in light of the fact of, um, again, we go back to Common Core and what math <laughs> is all about. Our standards are changing and they're, we're asking our students and our teachers to deepen that. And so I just wanted to bring that up in case parents didn't read that on their own, that without that approval, there are implications that I think ultimately would hurt our kids. Thank so. you for pointing that out. Uh, what is the advanced math actually in, in the middle school? What do we mean by? Well, I will do my best, and I know that Mr. Vogler's here if I need help, but in our curriculum at the middle school level, we do offer courses that would be um, labeled or identified more advanced, um, probably beginning with the offering of Algebra one and then Geometry, depending on the grade level. So <clears throat> we would, this, this would, Algebra one would fall in that category, Mr. Vogler, for any of our eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth graders that have tested and are ready to be placed in that class. I believe we also are offering Geometry at the middle school and again we would have eighth graders seventh graders or sixth graders in that course those are um, beyond probably what the majority of our students take uh, by the time they're eighth graders and so that's why we uh, put them in a category of more of an advanced accelerated math now curriculum let's, let's say for example you're taking a sixth grade student and putting them into a geometry section is, is sure. this at the high school? Uh, no, and that's part of the uniqueness here. We want to make this available to our middle school students at the middle school. But you mentioned the geometry offering. That is part of the reason why we're coming forward to you tonight, because what you will find is some of those sections might be lower in student enrollment than our regular math, uh, math curriculum classes. But we feel it's important to continue to offer them, uh, feel it's important to offer them at their school, um, as opposed to transporting them to the high school, which is an option, but that's not what um, I'm recommending. Uh, now, if they're scheduled for later in their school years, if their schedule requires a full year of geometry, does that waiver come in from that initial contact with geometry in, in middle school or would they have to take a full year of geometry later if they move to when they move to high school let's say an eighth grader this year takes the geometry at the middle school when they go to the high school in a year they would start in the next course that they're placed in after geometry okay. beyond geometry assuming they successfully completed the course <laughs> Okay, well then we'll move on to board reports and discussion at this time. I know we, would, we said we would try to make some room for Mr. Brown um, in the agenda and this would be a great play time for him. Is that working? No. It is. It is. I have a check here. Uh, I'm a member of the Knights of Columbus, and a lot of you know that we have our Tootsie Roll drive in the spring of the year, and we divide the profits amongst five different charities, and our special ed from Holman is one of them. And so we do thank all the people that are generous that help us with the money and also the business that let us stand in front of their doors and collect money. <laughs> we do have this check to prevent the... <laughs>
Mr. Brown, we always love it when you come to the board meetings and oftentimes you give us a little bit of advice and sometimes you give us a little bit of financial support and it's always much appreciated. So then I will call on board members if they like to share any committee reports they have, um, any thoughts or comments they'd like to make and start with Mr. Menninger. Uh, several things this evening. First off, uh, thanks Mr. Brown for coming this evening. Always good to see you here at the board's meeting, so thank you. Um, also very exciting, uh, you know, as the, the Corn Fest time of year comes around, there's always community recognition of, of people doing great things in the community. And uh, a couple of them have very close ties to the Holman School District. And uh, Patty Magnesky, actually an employee recognized for all of her great volunteer work throughout the community and certainly well-deserved, and congratulations to her. And then I see Lloyd uh, Drayson also recognized and a great supporter of Holman Schools and a supporter of the Booster Club. So congratulations to both of those as well. Um, my countdown to football is over because uh, <laughs> practice has already started. Um, however, I did note that three weeks from tonight is a school night, uh, meaning that uh, classes, you know, got to go to bed early. So time to start transitioning to those early times again. I know nobody will listen to that because my kids never did when they were at home, but it's time to start transitioning again um, into that as well. And then one thing I wanted to close with on a little more, um, I guess, serious topic of nature. A few weeks ago, I talked about the school voucher program. And I was reading in the paper this last week that there's, I think, 100 applicants for one of the local schools that's looking to take advantage of that. And as I was reading that article, it just struck me that uh, the qualifications for that is 185% of the, uh, the poverty level set to be eligible to apply for those vouchers. And I started thinking then about, you know, they say, uh, the rhetoric is that it's giving kids choices and options, although, you know, I think the, the public schools around this area are absolutely excellent, so I think there's plenty of options available. And then I started thinking about the Badger Care program that is designed to support kids with healthy initiatives that oftentimes don't have alternatives. And that is cut to 100% of the poverty level. And I started thinking about why it's 185% for the school vouchers, but only 100% was cut for the Badger Care program. And it seems to me like maybe the priorities are just a little mixed up and backwards with that sense. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Thank you. Mr. Trivet. Um, I just wanted to recognize the uh, staff, volunteers, and the teachers that gave their time earlier in the week for registration at high school and middle school. I hopped in there once or twice to fix up some scheduling stuff and register myself, and it was quite busy trying to get a thousand students to go through, so thank them for that. And then also, I believe it was yesterday, um, through the DECA program, they had some students go to the high school and do a cleanup project throughout the school to get it ready for the upcoming school year. And so just wanted to recognize them for trying to make the school a better place for um, when the school year starts, which is coming up fast. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Collins. Um, I just wanted to mention that my daughter, who is five, turned five in June, went through the summer school program at Viking, and um, she normally goes to Prairie View, and it was, uh, it was neat because I went, I actually needed to go to school with her for almost a week straight in the morning, take her to school, and she didn't, she wouldn't ride the bus, but um, she was a little <laughs> fearful of that because it was a new school, and, um, but there were a lot of kids there, and despite, you know, a lot of kids and, like, trying to prepare for all that, it was amazing to see, like, all the teachers and all the, the aides and things and volunteers that were there to help. I mean, there were a lot of kids. I went, and I'm like, where do I go? How do I get to the lunch line? How do I punch my number in? But it was, everyone was so nice and patient, and, um, it was, it was neat, neat to see. So, um, I think I can see the summer school program growing a lot. Um, a lot of parents are talking about it wanting to get their younger children into schooling experiences. So it was neat. It was really good. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunlap. <coughs> well, we have uh, school starting back up and all the athletic events going. So I, again, I want all the students to be safe and be careful out there and make sure they get home okay. And this is uh, one year that I kind of regret school starting because I finally have a grandchild in high school. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. All right, uh, Mr. Gittens. No comments. No comments. Uh, Ms. Mayor. Um, just thank you uh, to our staff. I know that over the course of the summer, many of our staff go back to school. 
Um, many, many are reading professional materials, and that's on their own time, and we all appreciate what you're doing. Um, secondly, just grateful to um, our board um, to have the opportunity for our team development, um, which is also a part of what all the teachers are doing well. Um, for me personally, um, it's reassuring that we'll have an opportunity to assess how we're doing. Um, how are we doing as a board with many, many categories? I mean, we're still learning about that. But I think that that's rare um, across the state and possibly across the nation for for us to do that, to take a look at where are we strong uh, and where do we have room for improvement. So I'm very grateful that the district is providing that for us um, and uh, look forward to our time together as board members. Um, um, and just uh, pretty soon, yeah, just welcome back to everyone. Uh, it's with great gratitude that Holman School District has who we employ. We are, we are incredible, I think and every single person who's coming back. Um, finally, the, uh, <coughs> building in grounds, um, things are looking so beautiful. Um, uh, special uh, thanks to, you always forget somebody, but I know all the stuff that's, stuff is not the right word because it's in technology that's going on. There's probably a better word than stuff, but there are some huge changes and our tech team must just be putting in tons and tons of time to get that up and running. So um, just thanks to everybody for that. Hey, thank you. Yes, I understand Mr. Dunlap and I missed a great um, session last Thursday and we will try to connect with Matt um, in, the next, in the coming weeks so that we can catch up with all of you. Um, I know I do appreciate those of you who are able to make it out coming um, and I am excited to hear about um, what the next steps are and where we go from here. Just made sure that we assigned you to oh, everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> Bring it on. We'll talk later. Bring it on. Bring it. <laughs> so I also would like to say kudos to Patty Bagnevsky and Lloyd Dresden, um, both quality people who we've known in the district for many years. And um, it, my granddaughter went to summer school too over in Viking. and. Uh, she came home talking about this little Liberty, Liberty girl. And so uh, Gary's daughter and my daughter were friends in high school, and it looks like our grandchildren are going to be friends too, so we'll have to watch out for that. Oh, no. <laughs> and finally, I had the opportunity of participating and helping witnessing the Miss Holman uh, pageant, and I'm very pleased and thankful to the people who brought it back, and also to the school district for opening its doors. The custodian who was there that evening, kudos to him, that day. I we started at about 11, and he was there and very um, helpful to us in meeting the needs of the pageant and the people. But just those young women, I'm so very proud of each and every one of them, and the the skills that they had. I was able to observe their interviews. Um, I also know that one of the young women on stage that night had interviewed earlier in the or earlier and then earlier in that week was um, hired as a new teacher in our district. Um, and she said the interview in the middle school was very intensive, but not quite <laughs> like Miss Wisconsin, but um, pretty intensive. Um, and it, you know, it just makes me very proud to see them. Um, perform and I know that to some that's you know a beauty contest and it really is not it is um, when you see them interview and you see them on stage and how eloquent they are and how self-confident they are and they are aren't always like that in the beginning of the week but at, by the end of the week they've really built that it's just a really nice program and it's the largest scholarship provider for young women of course, athletics is the largest scholarship provider for young men, um, and women haven't caught up there, but um, the pageant, Miss America pageant, provides for young women that opportunity for millions in scholarships. So again, just very proud of the young women who are representing us and the, the ones who participated. So um, that's all I have. 
Then moving on to um, correspondence and board, uh, we had some correspondence, of course, you receive that weekly. Board meeting schedule, August 26th is a big date. Remember, 6 o'clock we start um, with our board meeting, then the budget hearing, and then the annual meeting. Um, the 9th we have, September 9th, we have a board meeting, the 23rd a board meeting, and October 14th and 28th. Of course, school starts on September 3rd. Um, and so I know that as we start school, our committees will start to organize again, and please reach out to stakeholders, um, community members, staff members, all the stakeholders, um, students, we really like to see. And Colin, if you wanna find some students who might be interested in serving on board committees, um, we certainly would welcome that. Um, I know that you are on the Student Achievement and Learning Committee, I think, as your board um, participation so Kate will work with you on that making sure that you get scheduled for those meetings um, and next item is board policy and administrative rule um, re revision cycle that's so. a great great segue into this because <laughs> uh, all the committees are anxiously awaiting um, what you have in your packet uh, Mrs. Kovacs put this together we put this together for the board annually and it breaks it up per committee, the uh, board policies and administrative rules. And so you can kind of find, uh, whoever the committee chairs are, find your committee. And, and yes, some of you, it may look like you have very few reviews to do this year. And some of you, uh, you, have a, you have a list. That happens. It, it just kind of how we, a few years ago, how we, uh, reassign these to the committees and that's still kind of working its way through. I would say this for those committee chairs such as buildings and grounds and finance, if you're concerned because you don't have many there, <laughs> um, you know, certainly w work with we'll pass them on. <laughs> work with us because there might be something that uh, you can take one or two or however many and work ahead. It doesn't mean that we have to wait for that year that's listed there. So you may want to, again, work with your administrators that are helping you look ahead to next year, see what the list might be, and maybe you can try to start to balance that even more so. Um, otherwise, I would encourage you to look this over. Uh, let us know um, if you find anything, but if you turn to the second page, you'll see personnel and governance and there's a good example if you're wondering what must means and what should mean and again we look at the years and if it's must that means really uh, certainly anything that has not been reviewed prior to this year that was due by the date you'd be looking at doing that anything that has uh, 2013 to it we would be indicating should be done this year uh, um, actually must uh, could be put there and we can clean that up and 2014 could be considered should um, so that you're continually working ahead on that so take a look at these let us know let me know if you have questions especially if you're a committee chair and we're here to help you and assist you with those and um, as you know administratively we assist you in preparing a re, uh, revision of the policy to bring to the committee to at least help the committee get started on their review. So that's, uh, that's that, and you can let us know if you have questions. Okay. Then I would move on to the consent agenda item. Are there any items that you would like to have separated from the consent agenda items? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Next item, executive session. Ms. Mayor. Be it resolved that the Board of Education moves to executive session as per Wisconsin Statute 19.851G for the purpose of conferring with legal counsel regarding pending claim against the district. 
Is there a second? Second. Okay, would you do the roll call, please, Ms. Mayor? Happily. Tim Menninger? Yes. Lisa Collins? Yes. Gary Dunlap? Yes. Joe Gittens? Yes. Cheryl Hancock? Yes. Anita Jagosinski, uh, not present. And Kate Mayer? Yes. Okay, we will reconvene in about 